Okay. Good morning, dear local and international participants. I warmly welcome you uh, for all third and final day of 10th International Conference on Information and uh, Automation for Sustainability, also known as ICIFS 2021. Uh, today, we have a series of technical sessions lined up, including uh, two keynote speeches, uh, a business industry collaboration session, and multiple technical sessions and also a one special session based on machine learning for sustainability and data engineering for biology and medicine. To kick, to kick start this final day of the conference, let me warmly welcome and introduce our first keynote speaker for the day, Professor Siddhar Mahadevan. Professor Siddhar Mahadevan uh, is a fellow Association for Advancement of Artificial Intelligence, also known as AAAI. And he is an associate editor of Machine Learning and the Journal of Machine Learning Research. From 1997 to 2000, he was on the editorial board of the Journal for AI Research. He has been on numerous program committees for uh, various AI teams, technical renowned conferences. In 2021 and 2000, he served as an area chair for reinforcement learning at the ICML and NIPS conferences. In 2001, he co-authored a paper with his student Rajpala Makar and Mohammed that received the best student paper awards in the fifth international conference on autonomous agents. In 1999, he co-authored a paper with Gang Wang that received the best paper awards at the 16th international conference on machine learning. In 1993, he co-edited the book Robot Learning published by Kluwer Academic Press. He is a co-founder of Look Ahead Decisions, Inc., based in Berkeley, California. Professor Mahadevan received an NFS Career Award in 1995 and PhD uh, from Computer Science, uh, Rutger University, 1990. Professor Mahadevan joined the College of Information and Computer Science at the University of Massachusetts, Amherst, in fall 2001. Previously, he was an associate professor at the Department of Computer Science and Engineering at Michigan State University uh, from 1997 to 2001. From 1993 to 1997, he was an assistant professor in the Department of Computer Science and Engineering at the University of South Florida, Tampa. He worked at IBM TJ Watson Lab Laboratories in Hawthorne, New York from 1990 to 1993. From 1986 to 89, he was a visiting scholar in the School of Computer Science at Carnegie Mellon University. He is now a research a professor and also currently serving as a director at Adobe Research in San Jose, California. His current research interests in AI and ML revolve around creativity and imagination, fundamentally human abilities that few, if any, machines are good at. Professor Mahadevan, stage is yours, sir. Can you see my slide? Yeah, we can see your slide clearly. Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay. We can start. Thank you. Um, I'd like to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to talk with you today. Um, I'm very happy uh, to uh, share some of the recent ideas I've been exploring, and also give you a sense of uh, you know what I've done before and and some of the current challenges facing the field of AI. Um, I, since this is an IEEE uh, conference, I wanted to also say that I started actually um, as an electrical engineer. My undergraduate and uh, master's degrees were in electrical engineering. Uh, undergraduate was in actually electronics and communication, uh, which uh, was a very useful because it taught me a lot of useful uh, concepts like information theory and Fourier transforms and things you don't normally see in computer science at an undergraduate level. But those ideas have proved to be very valuable in my entire professional career. So uh, I, I moved into AI um, in grad school in India. Uh, I was at the Indian Institute of Technology and I came across this book uh, by Douglas Hofstadter, which was published uh, in the late 70s. It's called Gödel Escherbach. Uh, for those of you who don't know these names, uh, Kurt Gödel is a very famous mathematician. 
uh, who proved what's called the Gödel incompleteness theorem that says uh, any system of axioms that is powerful enough to uh, include arithmetic uh, is uh, necessarily incomplete, in that there are statements in that uh, system that cannot be shown to be true or false. This, of course, uh, shattered the hope that mathematics could be completely axiomatized. Um, Escher is an artist, a Dutch artist, who paints very geometrical uh, looking uh, pictures. And of course, uh, Johann Sebastian Bach is one of the founders of Western classical music. So this book is really uh, in, in many ways about creativity, um, but a lot of the book was on AI. And as someone studying electrical engineering, this book was a complete revelation to me. Um, so I decided I was gonna work in AI and I picked uh, one particular problem set in the book which is shown in the slide. These are called the Bongard problems from a Russian uh, pattern recognition researcher who had them in his uh, book. Um, so you see here um, two sets of figures on the top. You have uh, six boxes on the left and six boxes on the right. All the boxes on the left have a certain pattern that none of the boxes on the right uh, have. And it's very easy for humans to solve these visual puzzles, for example, the solution to the problem on the top is that all figures on the left are the same size and the figures on the right are of different sizes. So we see this very easily, but to get a computer to do this, even today, it's actually quite challenging. Um, at the bottom, we have a different problem, which is a little harder. It might take you a little longer to see the pattern here, um, but the number of little circles within the figure on the left is greater than the number of circles outside the enclosed figures, whereas on the boxes on the right, that pattern is not true. So we see these patterns instinctively uh, because evolution has given us the ability to find patterns. And this causes the basis for the field of machine learning to try to build machines that can uh, duplicate such abilities. Um, and I've worked in this field for about the last 40 years almost. Um, it's still the case that uh, no machine learning system that I know of can solve these Bungard problems given such few data. Here you have only a handful of examples of each category. This is what's called the classification problem in machine learning. Uh, typically the most popular deep learning algorithms that you see uh, that are talked about a lot in the press uh, require tens of thousands of examples. They're very slow learners um, because they're based on tuning uh, the weights of a very large number of uh, units by gradient descent. And because the problem involved is non-convex, the step size has to be made extremely small um, and they take a long time to converge. But human learning is not like that. Human learning is much more rapid. And one of the challenges in AI and machine learning even today is how to actually make uh, machine learning systems that are capable of rapid learning. So um, as was mentioned, I after graduating with my PhD, I moved to IBM Research where I entered a completely different field of uh, how to train robots that can learn autonomously. And the research I did there was published in a book by Springer uh, in the early 1990s. And if you look at that book, um, Actually, many of the ideas that people talk about are in this book. Uh, deep learning plays a big role in the book. Uh, reinforcement learning is in the book, as well as things like self-driving cars. So there was a chapter describing how you can use deep learning to build self-driving cars. That, that technology has taken about 30 years to enter the marketplace. Uh, and today you can buy a Tesla, for example, which is made very close to my home in uh, the Bay Area. Um, that has this technology because the technology has come a long way in the last 30 years. We have far more powerful computers. We have GPU machines, uh, but the essential conceptual basis is just the same as it was 30 years ago, which is the use of feed forward neural networks uh, to train the cars to drive. So um, a lot of what I did um, in the years uh, after I worked at IBM was study a particular model of decision-making called uh, Markov decision processes. This 
addresses the problem of how autonomous agents can make decisions that are optimal in the long term. Um, and this was originally formulated by uh, Richard Bellman and Ron Howard in the late 50s and early 1960s in operations research and management. It's also become the basis for reinforcement learning. You might have heard of all the work done by DeepMind uh, in London on solving uh, Atari video games or uh, beating humans at chess or Go. All of that uses the same framework of Markov decision processes. So this is based on a very simple idea of maximizing the immediate reward, in this case, the function R of XA. X is the state perceived by the agent, and A is the action being contemplated. Uh, and the, the future value of whatever state that occurs. So in this case, you have a stochastic transition to some state Y. You look at the value of state Y, and then you try to solve this system of nonlinear equations. Um, the main advantage of reinforcement learning is you don't necessarily require to ha have a model of the system. You don't need to know the transition probabilities, but you can sample it by actually experimenting with the simulated system or the real system. Uh, for example, this robot shown here on the bottom. Uh, in practice, it turns out to be very difficult to use Markov decision processes to solve problems in real time. Most of the successes are in simulation. Uh, and this remains, again, one of the huge challenges uh, in the field. So I was a director of the Autonomous Learning Lab at UMass, as was mentioned, for about uh, 20 years before I moved to the San Francisco Bay Area. And uh, there I uh, did a lot of work in many areas of machine learning, um, including things like manifold learning uh, and transfer learning. I won't talk about those. Instead, I want to focus on a direction that I started in the last few years, and it has to do with understanding how is it that humans are able to learn so quickly uh, based on uh, so little data. And I, I wrote a paper on this, which is not a technical paper, but it was more of a um, paper laying out a vision for what the next challenge for AI might be, and I call this imagination machines. Um, it was published in AAAI 2018 in a special track called the Blue Sky Track, which are for non-technical papers that pose a challenge to the field, and, and it ended up winning a, an award in that track. So one of the questions in the paper is, uh, if you look at many activities that humans do, for example, art, um, how is it that we're able to do creative activities like this and, and, and why uh, current systems are not capable of, of uh, solving these kinds of problems? Um, this uh, paper was also published in a book uh, called Aftershock, which was published last year. Um, it's a book that has a large number of uh, essays by people talking about what the next 50 years of technology uh, might actually bring us. And it was modeled uh, after a very famous book by Alvin Toffler called Future Shock, which was published in 1970, which actually predicted a lot of things uh, like, for example, the World Wide Web and social networks and, and the development of AI. Um, and Alvin Toffler's book predictions, uh, for example, of the impact of social networks and things like that have come true a large, to a large part. So the challenge for us in this book was to say, well, what can we say about what the future holds? Um, and you will find in this book a lot of uh, speculations on, on what might happen. And this is very much the topic of what I want to talk about today briefly, which is the problem of imagination. Imagination means we're essentially trying to predict what the world might be in the future based on you know, our knowledge of what's happening today and some guess for what might happen. So um, we're all familiar with what imagination means. Uh, here is a definition from the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy. Uh, it says to imagine is to form a mental representation that does not aim at things as they actually presently and subjectively are, but to represent possibilities other than the actual, to represent times other than the present, to represent perspectives other than one's own. So if you think of, for example, famous writers, uh, this is exactly what they do. They actually try to write about times different from their own, people um, 
trying to put themselves in the shoes of other people, uh, maybe for famous people. Um, and uh, a lot of science fiction, for example, is based on imagination. If you look at uh, the big uh, movie industry, whether it's in India and Bollywood or in the US and Hollywood, a lot of the money they make is based on movies that uh, are trying to imagine something about uh, you know, some future thing that might happen, right? So I want to say, why is this important for AI? First, uh, it's important to understand that we have had this ability for a very long time. Uh, this is a famous discovery uh, in a cave in Germany. It's called Lion Man. It, it's, it's a sculpture. Uh, it's a figurine of a, a mythical object uh, with the head of a lion and the body of a man. Clearly, this had no um, value in terms of hunting. Uh, it's a purely decorative object, and it was it didn't represent something that the human who carved it saw. It represented an amalgam of different things. You know, the head of a lion and the body of a man fused together. So it's an impossible object, and it shows that this capacity of imagination that we have uh, has been with us for a very long time. So um, there are lots of books you can find that essentially talk about creativity and imagination and how this is essentially what makes us uh, excel as a species, as opposed to other biological species that uh, live on the planet. And uh, I'm going to use this as a theme for uh, talking about the challenges that, that, that face AI. So um, scientists have long speculated on the power of imagination. Einstein was a particularly strong believer in the power of imagination, and he ranked it above what he called knowledge, because knowledge is essentially what the textbooks teach you. But imagination is what gives you new insights into the nature of the universe. Um, there are many ways to imagine. Um, and in this short talk, I don't have time to get into all of them. I will illustrate a few of them. But we imagine, for example, in language, uh, when we say things like the stock market crashed, uh, we don't necessarily mean a physical object has crashed. We, we use it as a metaphor. Uh, and this is an example of the power of imagination, which uh, language is full of. Uh, we can reason about events that didn't happen. So we can say, what if the COVID virus had not had such a dramatic effect on the world today? Uh, what would have been the outcome? And, and of course, it's counterfactual because there's no way for us uh, to revert history, but we do this all the time. Uh, we use imagination to abstract. Uh, the Lion Man is an example of what's called combinatorial creativity, just putting things together and then uh, being able to project into the future or the past uh, or to a distant place uh, is an example of imagination as well. Uh, and imagination has many, many applications. Um, for example, uh, art is an example of visual imagination. A lot of technology is based on imagination uh, in terms of the use of actual devices. Uh, and uh, I've already seen that imagination plays a crucial role in science. For example, understanding what the structure of a black hole is. None of us can ever visit the black hole and yet scientists spend their entire life studying this object. Um, we can also think about how machine learning can use imagination, which is something I will talk about. So to understand where imagination fits into machine learning, we have to understand the difference between what's called data science today and what I call imagination science. So data science essentially looks at data, which is a collection of uh, say measurements. So for example, for COVID, we might look at the number of infections that are happening every day. In the US, you might know that we're currently seeing another surge. We have over 100,000 infections a day. Um, but that doesn't tell us the most important thing. The most important thing for us is how do we actually control the infection? How do we reduce infection? So for that, we have to step beyond pure data science and we have to ask the question, what if we do a certain intervention? For example, what if we mandate that everybody must wear a mask? What if we mandate that people should uh, do social distancing, which is not to get too close to anyone else? 
Um, and this is an example of an intervention. Uh, and when you do this, it changes the distribution of data. Now, these interventions are highly um, debatable. If you look around the world, uh, you find that almost every country in the world has taken a different approach to trying to combat uh, COVID. So there's a big debate about what interventions are the most effective. So for example, in some countries like New Zealand and Australia, they have virtually shut the country down. Um, and as a result, they have very few infections. But on the other hand, they're very vulnerable to outbreaks because uh, once they open up, it's not clear what exactly might happen, right? Whereas in the United States, um, a lot of the economy has been opened up. The infections are pretty high. Um, Great Britain has taken the same uh, stance. We also saw a large outbreak in India, for example. The second part of imagination science is understanding whether an intervention worked or not. And that is the why question, right? If you did something like, for example, let's say you implemented a mask mandate and it didn't have the effect that you thought it might have, you have to explain why. And this is the topic of counterfactual reasoning. So essentially you can think of imagination science within machine learning as taking the additional step of looking at interventions that change the data in some way, and then trying to explain whether the intervention worked or if they didn't work, why they didn't work. So in the context of a digital marketing system, for example, we can uh, data mine user behavior, which Adobe uh, does uh, at a very large scale, as I'll just illustrate quickly. Uh, but then we can look at interventions like, for example, what if we change the price of the units that we're selling? Maybe we're selling masks or we're selling um, you know, toothpaste or whatever it is we're selling. Um, shoppers always, uh, shopping uh, online shopping uh, marketplaces always think of having sales because they are sort of looking at interventions to increase their sales. Uh, and then Sometimes the interventions work. Let's say you had a discount, but you've sold fewer items and you have to try to explain why this intervention didn't actually work. Um, we see imagination in art. Um, for example, on the right is a famous painting by a very young painter, uh, Jean-Michel Basquiat, who died at, at, at a very early age. Um, and he came out of uh, the Bronx as a graffiti artist. And this particular painting of his sold for over $100 million at an auction in New York. It was bought by a Japanese collector. It's clearly a very imaginative painting. It doesn't actually show a face literally, like a photograph. It, it shows a very artistic rendering. And, and you know what is Basquiat trying to say in this piece? And of course, why is it worth so much money? Um, regardless, we can sort of say, what is it that humans do when they do such behavior? And you know, can machines do this kind of uh, art? Um, a lot of the challenges that are involved, um, I don't have time to get into. I will ask uh, those interested to look at my tutorial at AAAI a few years ago on how many of the problems involved in imagination require moving from the standard tool of optimization that we have used in AI for the last 50 years uh, to something that's more sophisticated um, and it was already developed in physics for a problem in physics by an Italian mathematician called Stampaccia, uh, and then used for solving all kinds of interesting problems like the modeling traffic um, and game theory and so on. And these are called variational inequalities. Um, I'll say a little bit more about this later. So for example, if you look at training a generative adversarial network, a GAN model, and there was a tutorial on GAN models at your workshop, uh, then, uh, it turns out a lot of the mathematics that GAN use, GANs use involve solving problems in game theory. Uh, and uh, the standard optimization methods, for example, taking the gradient uh, is not necessarily a very good way to solve GANs, even though this is uh, turns out to be a lot of what people do currently. Um, so understanding uh, the effects of interventions is in an area called causal inference. Uh, and there's been a lot of work over the last 100 years or more on causal inference. It actually goes back to the work of people like David Hume, a philosopher who lived about 200 years ago. And um, the idea in causal inference is to understand the effects of doing actions and to try to explain what these actions did and also try to understand the effect of 
hypothetical actions. Like, uh, what if I had not done this? What if I had done something else? Like, for example, I can ask the question, what if I had continued to be in electrical engineering and not moved to AI? What would my career have been then? And this is an example of a counterfactual. There's a very nice book by Uriah Pearl, uh, who has worked uh, in the field of causal inference within AI for the last 30 or more years. Uh, there's been a lot of work in causal inference in fields like statistics, economics, uh, the health sciences, and so on. Uh, and so all of this work is essentially trying to address the same problem. And imagination shows up here because uh, when you take interventions and you're trying to understand whether they worked or didn't work, you're trying to imagine possible uh, futures. So at Ruby, we're developing a multi-layer architecture that combines data science uh, experimentation in terms of interventions, counterfactual reasoning, and creativity and imagination. This is very much uh, in, in the conceptual phase, but I will say briefly where this fits into Adobe's business uh, as it stands right now. So um, those of you who know about Adobe might know us from uh, Adobe Photoshop or Lightroom uh, or maybe Adobe PDF. We invented the portable document format standard. But Adobe also runs uh, the world's largest uh, data science operation in terms of managing the digital assets uh, of many, many companies. You know, the majority of the world's largest companies use Adobe Experience Cloud. This includes media companies, financial services, automobile companies, uh, telecommunications, uh, hotel chains, airlines, uh, and pharmaceutical companies, and so on. So all of these companies are storing petabytes of data uh, representing, for example, online commerce, uh, information about their consumers. Uh, and Adobe Experience Cloud um, is a collection of data science uh, uh, packages that helps these companies analyze and gather insights from, from this data. Um, and a lot of what my group does is essentially uh, deal with the challenges of scaling to very, very large data sets uh, in real time. And uh, unfortunately, the algorithms are highly technical and some of them are, are copyrighted, so I can't talk about them. But I want to say that um, the challenge here is that even if you collect very large amounts of data, it might not help if the world changes in some unpredictable way, as, for example, our world has changed due to COVID. So you need imagination, not just uh, for the reasons I talked about, but also for the fact that the world might suddenly change and then you have to sort of try to understand how you can cope in, in this new world, right? So for example, uh, there's this well-known book by the author uh, Nassim Taleb called The Black Swan. The Black Swan is a very rare event. So for example, the COVID-19 crisis is a black swan event. It's a highly improbable event, but it has a huge impact on many of the economies of the world. Uh, the 2008 financial crisis, the World Trade Center attack, all of these are black swan events that were not predicted, but then they had a huge um, impact on the world. And Taleb argues that it is these kinds of events that really have a major impact on the development of technology and of, on economies. And these are exactly the kinds of problems that current AI systems are really not very good at, at, at dealing with. Uh, and so one of the challenges in the field is how do we uh, do a better job in modeling these kinds of black swan events, uh, which represent very rare events. So for example, climate change is an example where this year, for example, there were record floods in Germany and uh, that caused a lot of deaths. And there was a complete failure in terms of how to plan for these events. So this is the challenge of uh, imagination. Um, I can say a lot more, but uh, I, I'm, I'm probably at the end of my time. So maybe I should stop and ask for questions.
Does anyone have any questions? I can't hear. Um, I think you might be muted. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can oh. hear you now. There, there's a question uh, in the chat box, Professor. If you go to the stage uh, chat, there's a question okay. from one person. So for the audience, if you have any questions, you can put on either uh, in stage chat or the event chat. Uh, so the question asks, uh, you know, transfer learning is close to the patterns, how human approach new problems, you use knowledge extracted from familiar problems and try to map with the attributes of the strange problem. How will it help imagination machines? And that's a good question. I, um, so, for example, with uh, technologies like GANs, um, there is an attempt to try to solve the transfer learning problem by essentially looking at paired data sets. Uh, this is used, for example, in autonomous car technology. So one of the problems in building autonomous cars is that no matter how much data you, you train the system on, you can never represent every possible situation that the car might encounter. So for example, if you train the car while it's driving um, on uh, a particularly sunny day on a stretch of highway, say Highway 101, which runs close to my house, um, then what if it was night uh, and you were driving along the same road? Or what if it was rainy? You know, what if it was snowing? So essentially the problem is that there is virtually an infinite set of possible situations under which you might be driving on that particular stretch of road. Um, and so this is the transfer learning problem, right? Um, and so the current approach is to try to use something like GANs. Um, it's not clear this is entirely successful um, so this is an example of where I think uh, imagination science is an important aspect uh, of the, you know, puzzle in AI that we're missing, uh, because clearly humans are very good at um, generalizing from the experiences they have uh, on driving particular roads at different times of day and then being able to cope uh, when, uh, when the world changes. So there was a recent uh, survey article on deep learning for AI by the three researchers who won the Turing Award uh, recently for deep learning, Jeff Hinton, Jan Le Kun, and uh, Joshua Bengio. It's a very good article published in the communications of the ACM. And one of the challenges they outline in that article is exactly this, which is transfer learning. They, you know, they say how humans are very good at coping uh, with changes in uh, the world, uh, and they don't require uh, retraining, uh, you know, uh, whereas deep learning systems are very uh, vulnerable to this, this sort of problem, right? So uh, a lot of the technology we have today doesn't scale very well, and I think autonomous car technology is, is a good example. Um, okay, so there's questions on, on GAN models. Uh, what sort of distributions can GANs model? And, and I think uh, this is, uh, again, uh, an unsolved problem. Uh, it's, um, there's been a lot of work on different classes of GANs. Uh, you know, for example, the original GAN models uh, were based on training with uh, a loss function, uh, which is called the Shannon Jensen divergence. Uh, so you look at the difference between the distribution of the real images and the generated images, and you try to reduce that distance using the Shannon Jensen divergence. Um, and since then, there have been a lot of different types of divergences used, uh, for example, F divergences uh, and, and variations in terms of the loss function. Uh, but the state of art in GAN technology is still very uh, much at a primitive stage, I would say, in terms of the theoretical work. They're used very widely, even in Adobe, GANs are used quite extensively. 
Um, but I don't think we have a good theoretical handle on, on GAN. So we can't answer, for example, you know, what distributions do GANs work well on? Because one can, one, people have come up with very simple distributions on which GANs fail. Um, one of my PhD students actually worked on how to theoretically model GANs. Uh, and you can find the paper on, on my webpage at UMass. Uh, it turns out to be a very difficult problem. Um, and he spent a long time actually trying to understand GANs. Uh, the problem is that uh, GANs involve this two-player game between a generator and a discriminator. Um, and the dynamics is, is uh, very different from, say, training a single neural net. Uh, and this is why variational inequalities turns out to be very helpful. Uh, but the mathematics gets quite difficult uh, because in the simple variational inequalities model, you assume that uh, the problem is uh, essentially what's called a monotone uh, uh, mapping, which is the generalization of convex functions. Uh, but GANs are not convex, so they're non-convex. So, so um, there are some insights that come from it. Uh, and, and Ian Gamp, who was my PhD student, and now he works at DeepMind in London, um, you know, came up with some extensions uh, based on on modeling GANs as a vector field because you have a, a set of gradients, one for the discriminator, one for the generator. Incidentally, we came up with a variation of GANs where we had multiple discriminators. And that uh, idea, which was published about five, six years ago in the uh, International Conference on Learning Representations, has been used for a lot of other GAN models for example, the NVIDIA demonstration of very realistic face rendering uses multiple discriminators and generators. So uh, it turns out these, these multi-generator discriminator models are even more complicated to analyze. Um, and uh, if you go to my AAAI tutorial or my recent Imagination Machines tutorials, you will find uh, you know, some more technical uh, descriptions of, of how this in how we are thinking about it. But it's, it's very much a, an open problem. Uh, and uh, also the question about uh, how does GAN training scale with bat size? Uh, again, uh, we actually don't know the answer to this, except experimentally, people have done lots and lots of work with GANs. Uh, and they have come up with various rules of thumb uh, I'll give you a simple example of a problem that actually uh, one of the interns that worked in my lab last year did, uh, and it's just been published uh, in a computer vision conference. So uh, one of the uh, assets that Adobe manages is Adobe Stock. You might have seen Adobe Stock. Uh, it's one of the largest uh, um, repositories of digital images um, on the web, and a lot of companies use Adobe Stock. If you search for Adobe stock images in a particular category, you get a very biased um, representation of images. For example, if you search for plumber in Adobe stock, you get back essentially maybe male plumbers from a certain ethnic group, right? Uh, and so in other words, the, the, the data is very biased because the data was essentially collected in a certain way that's not very representative of what you'd like to see. So one can ask the question, how do we generate data from Adobe stock that is more diverse? So for example, it shows female plumbers, it shows plumbers of different ethnic groups and so on and so forth. And we can say the same thing for, for nurses. Maybe you search for nurses and you always get maybe female nurses, or you search for chefs and you always get male chefs. Uh, and, and this problem occurs all over the place. So you can try to solve this with GANs, which is exactly what the student did. Um, and it turned out to be quite interesting, but it requires a lot of data. What he did was combine a bunch of different GANs to essentially construct or imagine, uh, for example, you take female faces and you know images of plumbers and you have to graph them together to create this new category of a, you know, female plumber, maybe you don't have that representation in your data set in Adobe Stock. Uh, so he managed to make it work, but uh, it took a lot of effort. Uh, and uh, that's exactly the kind of problem we have with data science 
is that even if you collect a large amount of data, uh, it might be biased in some way, um, whether it's autonomous cars or it's Adobe stock images or digital marketing, the same problem occurs in all of them. Uh, and I think this is where imagination turns out to be actually very, very helpful. Um, And Professor, there's another question, I mean, uh, at the bottom, a new question. Okay, yes, all right. So, uh, tail approximations on rare events. Um, okay, so this seems to be, the, the, multiple, the multiple questions there, but, but let me take each one of them. So, uh, if you look at rare event analysis, it turns out, um, actually, statisticians have been studying rare events uh, modeling of rare events for a long time. Um, and I, I mentioned the floods in Germany. That's actually exactly the problem that has been studied. So let's say you have data for maybe 100 years of floods, uh, but you really want to know uh, in a 1,000 years how bad of a flood can you get. But you don't have data for that. You only have data for 100 years, and it might not show you how bad the floods can get. So you can't use standard statistics to solve this problem. You have to use a different kind of statistics. Uh, so for example, there are things like the Gumbel distribution, which came from the scientist Gumbel, who was a statistician who studied the problem of predicting rare events. Uh, rare event prediction is also hugely important in insurance. Uh, for example, we had the catastrophic collapse of a condominium building in Florida recently, which killed over 100 people. Uh, and this is an extremely uh, negative event for real estate, for you know, obviously the loss of human life. And you'd like to, if you're an insurance company, uh, you'd like to have an idea of how bad your insurance losses can be in the worst possible case, even if it's a very rare event, right? So, um, and, and so there is, uh, tools in statistics for prediction of rare events, uh, but these have not actually had a major impact in machine learning. Most of the work in machine learning uh, focuses on, I would say, prediction uh, of sort of the major modes of the distribution. For example, the, the mean or the variance, uh, the, the, the simple moments, but not rare events, right? Uh, and and it relates to imagination because essentially trying to predict a rare event is exactly related to imagination. So uh, one of the quotes from you know, this uh, village in, in Germany that was completely destroyed by the floods, the mayor of the village said, uh, we, did, we could not even imagine that the floods would be so bad in this particular village. Uh, and and it, it's exactly the failure of imagination that can cause a lot of loss of life. Um, and um, so this is why I think uh, these problems are uh, underrepresented in machine learning currently, but, but they will turn out to be very important in the future, especially for things like climate change, where our ability to tackle climate change depends very much on our ability to imagine rare events that, that might happen. Uh, in California, for example, right now, we're having terrible forest fires, um, and these fires are now occurring in many parts of the, of the world, for example, Greece, in Cyprus, in Russia, in Siberia. Um, many areas are having, uh, you know, fires of a size that they never saw before. Um, and in large part, uh, in the next 30, 50 years, you know, we might actually see much worse events happen. So a lot of it has to do with the prediction of rare events. Um, uh, the other part is quantum computing, which uh, is, is uh, you know, uh, an interesting question. Um, how will quantum computing change the field of AI and machine learning? My guess is it will have a dramatic impact once we get reliable quantum computers, which we don't yet have. Although this morning there was an article saying Google, uh, in, in collaboration with Princeton and, and a whole bunch of other universities, has uh, managed to solve a particular problem in quantum computing having to do with uh, stability of these quantum bits called qubits. And these are called time crystals. 
based on uh, a conjecture made by a physicist, uh, uh, a Nobel Prize winning physicist about 20 years ago. Uh, so, you know, there's a lot of progress happening in quantum computing. Um, it might turn out to be uh, a game changer, you know, once we have the technology to make it reliable, that's not happening yet. Uh, so it's hard to say. There are also theoretical results that question whether quantum computers can really solve, uh, for example, NP-complete problems that we can't solve with today's computers. Uh, so, so that's, again, unclear. I think, Professor, that's all the questions we have. OK. All right, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Professor Siddhar Mahadevan, uh, for sharing us your valuable knowledge with us in this morning. Uh, okay. And also, uh, I think, I mean, since there are a lot of undergraduate and graduate students also uh, participate in this event, they might have an idea now. Uh, they need to be extra careful about when it comes to the machine learning and AI, uh, about the bridge between the data science and also the imagination science. Do you have any final advice for them? Like, uh, if they are thinking about this bridge or relationship, how they can proceed or where to refer, I mean, how they can start their journey in that direction? Yeah, you know, um, like I said, you know, my journey started with reading the book by Douglas Hofstadter. Um, and, uh, you know, you have to find your own path. Uh, my advice to you would be to don't focus on things that are very popular today because uh, that means there's a lot of people working on it. So uh, areas like deep learning are very, very popular, but there are hundreds of thousands of people working on deep learning. So you should try to find a new path. Uh, that's what I still try to do. I, I, I work on problems that I think are not, uh, you know, that are not that popular because basically because I was doing machine learning 30 years ago and very few people were doing machine learning. Uh, and, and so I'm constantly trying to see what new problems and challenges there are. I still think there's a, a huge gap that separates uh, human intelligence from machine intelligence, regardless of what you read in the press. Uh, you know, humans are considerably more sophisticated in their ability to use data and to generalize, to make analogies, to create uh, than any machine uh, that we know how to build. Um, so AI is still a very much an open problem. So don't get the idea that somehow AI is solved. <laughs> We're a long way from solving AI. And so if you're wanting to enter this field, there's lots of interesting work that still has to be done. Thank you very much, Professor. Thank, Thank you. you. Very much. Have a nice right. day. Okay, bye.